What a journey it's been these last 14 years. You know, I've been thinking back, I've been doing a lot of reminiscing, and um, I started thinking about my very first week in ministry in this congregation. Go back in the way back time machine, 2006, it was on the bus from Elizabethtown to Fort Collins, Colorado, on the NYC bus, the National Youth Conference bus. We headed across the country, and there's nothing that builds community quite like being in a bus for days on end with 50 of your new best friends. We were seeing the sights. We we were taking in things all across the country. We were playing games on the bus. We were getting to know one another. We were cooking together and eating together and praying together and worshiping together. Man, it was something. The sights, the sounds, um, the smells, wow, it, it, was, it was unbelievable. But the thing that I remember most about that trip happened in Wyoming. We'd stopped for lunch, and we were on the vast western plains in Wyoming, and I got, a, I got a call on my cell phone. And the call was not a good one. The chair of my search committee, a respected member of the congregation, an ordained minister in the Church of the Brethren, had been arrested and jailed. He had been arrested and jailed for trying to solicit what he thought was a 13-year-old girl. In fact, it was law enforcement in a sting operation. Wow. My head was spinning. Like we all do sometimes, I'll confess my first thoughts were about me. What does this say about me that my search committee chair had done this? Will this impact my ministry in the congregation? But then quickly, I began to realize there was a lot more at stake than just me. I began to realize that, oh my, how are we going to tell this to the kids? Are we going to tell this to the kids? What if one of them was a victim? They were right in the same age group of those whom this person was accused of trying to connect with. Well, here's what I did. I gathered the advisors together and we put our wisdom, our collective wisdom, all in that same circle. And we decided, you know, the best thing to do is to be out front, open with our youth, trusting them as young adults, trusting ourselves as community that we can do this. And so that's exactly what we did. Right there in the parking lot of an Arby's in Wyoming, I took the microphone, the PA system on the bus, and I laid it out. What we knew, what we didn't know. I let them know that we as advisors and pastors were available to them, that we were a community, that we supported one another, that we cared about one another, and no matter what happened, we were going to get through it together. We grew together a lot in those moments. It solidified who we were as a community together. It was beautiful. Out of the ashes of something terrible, something beautiful came forward. That's one example of what it's been like in these 14 plus years with me as pastor in this congregation. You know, we have grown together, we have learned together, we've laughed together, we have cried together. I love you. And I have always felt loved by you. My family and I have been embraced with a love that we will never forget, that we can never forget. And so when I thought about my last sermons that I have the privilege of sharing with you here, I thought long and hard about what I wanted to say. And the first, I just said, I love you. I care about you. I will miss leading you. I will miss being part of this congregation. I will miss the spirit that is in this place. Even in an empty sanctuary, I know that you are all out there and we are still gathered in God's spirit. But there's more. I not only want to tell you that I love you and that I will miss being part of this place, but I want to share with you some encouragement and some challenge. 
The title for this series is Food for Thought, Food for Faith. That will be the, the theme for our next four weeks. And for the next four weeks, I'm going to share some things that I feel like you and we need to take up. Things that we need to start doing and things that we need to stop doing if we want this congregation to live into the fullness of who God would wish it to be with a meaningful and faithful future. A future that impacts people's lives. A future that enriches our communities that are vast and broad geographically now. A future that makes the world a better place in Jesus' name. I want the very best for this congregation. And I think as many of you know, my family will continue to attend here and I hope to return after an appropriate time away. I want this place to thrive. Because here's the thing, I don't know if you know it, and I know that some of you forget it because you're just a little too close. But there is a theological approach. There is a way of following Jesus. There is a spirit here that is not found in any other congregation in the region. That's why many of you are joining us from across the country, from across the state, from across the world. And so I'm going to be sharing some things in these next four weeks. And here's the warning. Some of them will be hard to hear. Some of them will be difficult. Some of them you may disagree with. And I'll confess that there is a part of me, that sort of little Greg immature part of me, that thinks, you know, it'd be a whole lot easier to stand up for these next four weeks and just say nice fluffy things and ride off into the sunset. And you'd all feel really good about that. But because of what I started with, I love you. Because I love you, I can't live at that surface level. I have to be honest with you, and I hope that you can be honest with me. And so for each of these Sundays, we're going to have the talk back at the end. You're going to have an opportunity to put into the chat questions that you have, places where, where you might want to challenge my thinking, places where you want to share your thoughts too. Again, this is the church of Jesus we're talking about. We should be able to share openly. Let's do that. You know, there's another reason that I want to share with you, and it's this. In the past couple of months, I've heard that there is this very convenient but not totally accurate narrative. And it's a narrative that says, well, Pastor Greg is leaving because he received this offer from this really neat organization that works on anti-racism and leadership training and so on and so forth. He felt the call to go there. It was just too good of an opportunity to pass up. That's true, but that's not the whole story. There are also reasons why I am leaving this place. Reasons that have nothing to do with the wonderful new opportunity that I'm going towards. And so again, here's what we're going to do over the next four Sundays. Each Sunday, I'm going to remind you, us, of who we are when we are at our very best. And today, we're going to talk about the value of community. Each Sunday, we're also going to talk about that value, in this case, community, and I'm going to encourage you to see it from a slightly different perspective than you might. Because if we're not careful, the values that we have, like community, if we're not careful, those practices and values can become stumbling blocks just as much as they are launch pads. So, Let's take a look at things from a different perspective. Now, I have a little show and tell here, and I think the video guys are gonna put this up for you. What do you see when you look at this picture? When you look at this illustration, what do you see? Well, 
It all depends on your perspective, I suppose. Some people look at this illustration and they see an old woman. An old woman with a headscarf, her face buried in a deep coat. Other people look at this illustration and they see a young woman. They see a young woman with her face turned away from the illustrator. Can you see both? Which one do you see first? If you don't see them, here is hopefully a helpful way to look at that so that you can see both images clearly. Now, neither image is wrong, neither image is right, but it does show us how a shift in perspective can sometimes illustrate new learnings. It can broaden our horizons and broaden our perspective. We can then see things in more than just one way. And so that's what we want to do. We're going to talk about things, and then I'm going to encourage you to think about making a subtle but clear pivot or shift. So the beauty of community is today and how community can sometimes hold us back. I want to begin with a familiar scripture. It's a scripture I think that many of you sort of fill in the gaps on, but we're going to take a look at it, and then we're going to fill in the gaps a little different way. The scripture comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. Now, I want to give some setup here because it's important. It's important to understand the first sentence, but also important to understand the frame of mind from which Jesus is coming here. Just before this, in this gospel, Matthew tells us that Jesus has learned of the execution, the beheading of what we assume is probably his best friend, his cousin, his partner in missional work, John the Baptist. Jesus has just learned of this, and the Scripture goes on. Now, when Jesus heard this, this news, he withdrew from there into a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They, the disciples, replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he, Jesus, said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. Now we're going to dig deeper into that scripture in just a moment. But again, I want to go back in that way back time machine, that back to the year 2006. Karen and I just moved back to the States from Brazil. Ellen, our now 17-year-old, was two. Julia, our now 15-year-old, was not yet walking. And Kai, well, Kai just wasn't yet. And here we were, joining E-Town Church of the Brethren. Wonderful. E-Town Church of the Brethren, a leading congregation in the denomination, but I think fair to say one that was coming through some challenging times. Within the first year of starting here, along with the normal transitions that a congregation and a new pastor encounter, together we lived the highs and lows of community. As I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, a high-profile member was arrested and jailed. Less than a year after that, another member, Ray Diener, 
was brutally murdered on his front steps. The lows were low indeed. But then the highs, a congregation bouncing back, a resurgence in attendance and vitality and giving, a community getting back its mojo. Karen and I had our third child, Kai, the Friday before Palm Sunday of my very first Easter here at E-Town Church of the Brethren. And do you know what I saw in all of these good times and bad? What I saw was a congregation that knew how to love, a congregation that knew how to come together and knew how to reach out and pull others close, a community of Jesus followers who were willing to sacrifice for one another. Can you imagine people willing to sacrifice for one another? And not only just for one another, but for the community at large. And they did this time and time and time again. You know, in some ways it just makes sense, right? It's woven into our Christian and our brethren DNA. The first Christians faced tremendous pressures and threats that brought them together. Brought them together in love and strength. Different setting thousands of years later, but similar pressures and similar results for the early brethren. We are a people who need community, who depend on community. We're meant for it. And as Jesus tells us, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. When we gather together, Jesus is here with us. But let's go back to today's scripture. Like I said, a, a familiar one. We, we know the scene in our mind, right? Throngs of people following Jesus around, begging for the nourishment of his teaching and healing. Then the day gets late. People are out and far from towns, nowhere to buy food, and we know the rest of the story, right? Jesus feeds 5,000 with just five loaves and two fishes. What? How? Well, we usually imagine that Jesus miraculously multiplied the loaves and fishes so that there was enough for everyone to eat and have their fill and have leftovers. But did you catch it? That's not really what the Scripture said. It's not what it said explicitly anyway. The Scripture says that Jesus took the food and He blessed it. Then He gave it to the disciples, who then gave it to the people. And they ate and were filled. Now, maybe the food was miraculously multiplied. But there's another take on this story that I think is just as profound and powerful. It goes like this. The miracle that Jesus performed that day was opening the tight-fisted hands of that crowd so that whatever they had, when those baskets came around, some people took what they needed and others put in what extra they had. They became a community. They went from a group of individuals who was there just to see Jesus to becoming a group of people who cared for and took care of one another. That was the miracle of community that happened that day. But did you catch what else is happening there? The disciples wanted to send everybody away, home, to fend for themselves. Until Jesus said, now wait, wait, wait. They don't have to go. And when the, peop when the people are clamoring for food, Jesus showed that they had more than they ever imagined. They had the power of one another. And here is the perspective shift that I spoke of earlier. In this case, it's for the disciples. Now, the disciples, in their defense, were probably feeling a little overwhelmed. They didn't have the resources to feed all of these people, and they knew they were hungry. They, I'm guessing they probably also wanted to get back to business as usual without tripping over 5,000 of their closest new friends, right? 
They were probably thinking, well, things were pretty good with our little group of 13 or so. We were learning a lot. We were a nice community of 13, weren't we? It was so good. And we see how community can become exclusive. Just like the disciples probably wanted to keep it to just those few who they really knew, who they really gathered with, who they'd been through some stuff with. Community, as beautiful as it is, can sometimes become clicky. It can become a club. That's why the disciples said, hey, Jesus, send the crowds away so they may go into the village and buy food for themselves. And Jesus says, they need not go away. Get this, you give them something to eat, Jesus says. But Jesus, we only have five loaves and two fish. And Jesus says, okay, bring it to me. Jesus asks them to shift their perspective. You give them something to eat. Jesus could have just as easily done it by himself, but he doesn't. You give them something to eat, he says to the disciples. Shift your perspective. You have much more than you realize. So here's the food for thought. And this is how every sermon is going to end, or at least the latter part of every sermon will be over these next four weeks. Food for thought. It was in the first couple of years of my ministry here in this very sanctuary. Sunday morning is bustling. The energy was beautiful in the building. As I was coming into the sanctuary, an elder pulled me aside and he mentioned how excited he was, how beautiful it was to see the number of people who were latching on and becoming part of our community. He was excited to see the growth in the congregation, pointing out the new faces that he had never met before. I agreed, and I asked him, well, hey, what do you think we should do to keep this momentum going? To which he responded, oh, no, we're good now. We're, we, we don't need to add any more people. We have just enough that the pews look full, but not too many that we're getting crowded. And plus, I think we can, we can make our budget with this number. I'm not making this up. That's a sentiment that we've heard time and time again. It was an important lesson for me that day. Even as silly as it may sound, there is a sentiment that exists not only in this congregation, but in many congregations, in many communities. One place where it's come up recently, for example, is would we consider two services, two worship services, to reach more people in our community? The response from many was, oh, of course not. We couldn't be all together at once. It would ruin our community. Quite frankly, when you dig a little deeper, many have flat out given up on the idea of this congregation growing. Some of you, again, to lay it on the table, have blocked efforts for us to grow as a congregation. Some have done this just because you like things the way they are. You're comfortable. Okay, I get that. Other people just don't like change. Some so wounded from the rough years, now in the good years, don't want to risk adjusting those rabbit ears on the antenna to get better reception. What pains me, though, is that oftentimes these efforts are blocked in the name of community. If we grow too large, the community just won't be the same. Well, I reckon that's factually true. But you know what I hear? What I hear is the disciples, send the crowds away so that they can go into the villages to buy food for themselves. And then I hear Jesus, they need not go away. 
you give them something to eat. You know what really surprised me when I received an offer to work for another organization? What really surprised me was my excitement to be part of a group that believes so much in what they do and what they're about that they want to see it grow to impact more people. What does it tell us? What does it tell us when I think that I can have more positive impact in a for-profit organization that believes in what they do than I think I can have as part of the church? Hard for me to say, and I'm sure hard for you to hear. Food for thought. Let me ask you something. What do you think this congregation will look like in 20 years, in 30 years? A simple demographic look, and you don't need studies and reams of paper to tell us this. A simple demographic look at the congregation shows that we are an aging group. Now, it's been absolutely awesome that there has been an influx of younger people in recent years, and I will add because we were very intentional about providing ministries for that group. But that surge thus far is not large enough to maintain our current levels of ministry and witness. And so here's some more food for thought. What would it be like to be intentional about growth, to own that what we have, that what we're a part of is so special that we want to share it with other people. Now, this has been a taboo topic in my time here. It, again, I know that sounds weird to a lot of folks. It's seen as unbecoming or impolite to be so bold as to say that we want to grow this community to positively impact people's lives. And again, people often use community. We don't want to spoil the community. The response is, well, if people really need us, they'll find us. In addition to this just being flat out wrong, people will not necessarily find us. It's also the definition of hiding our lights under a bushel. Just like Jesus said, you don't light a candle and put it under a bushel, you put it on a stand so that everybody can benefit from the light. We have a message of light, peace, service, openness to all. That should be shouted from rooftops, folks. And here's the thing. Right now, we also have a tremendous, incredible opportunity right in front of us, in spite of what COVID has done to us as a community, as a nation, as a world. It's also taught us how and with whom we can gather in community. The world has just become a much larger place for us because of the blessing of technology. So here's some more food for thought. How can we reimagine community so that it includes congregants both in person and online? When this is all over and this building is full again, which I'm confident it will be, and we have hundreds of people online, which I'm hopeful there will be. How can we craft a community that brings people together, provides the best of community, and cares for and feeds one another? Yes, it will mean that in-person worship will look different. Yes, it will mean that we will find new ways of doing things. Yes, it will mean that we will try some things and fail. However, we will also try some new things and we will feed people and the blessing will be multiplied. We've received the nourishment of this community even in these times when we've been forced to physically distance ourselves. We know that we're not alone. We know that our church family cares for us, prays for us, supports us and carries us. It's an honor to be part of this community. And so, 
I'm going to stop right there. Time is running out. We are going to have a talk back just after our closing hymn, benediction, and closing music. But I want to leave you with these words. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, Jesus looked up to heaven and he blessed and broke the loaves. And he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled.